I said before that I don't believe that novels are um, clearly defined. I don't believe anybody really knows what they are. We just kind of accept them and revere them and we put them on a, a, a little pedestal just in the in the literary world and also in the in the real world amongst people that don't read the word novel has this kind of meaning to them and i've i've noticed that it it does carry all that weight because if i tell them i write flash fiction then it's sort of the, you know that blank stare they're like okay <laughs> you're like what does that mean and there's you know but if you say oh i have a novel coming out that's exciting you know there's something you know recognizable about that but if we had to ask them so what is it what is it supposed to look like you know, they can't really give you much except maybe oh, some hundreds of pages. It's kind of like, you know, they'll hold up their hand. It's like, it looks like this maybe, and it's going to know shape. But in reality, when you look deeply into the form, it can be a lot of things. And it had to be in order for me to invest in it because I don't really like the form of a novel. I am very much committed to the short story. And I got lucky because that is what we get trained to do as grad students in creative writing programs we are taught how to write a short story. And generally not even a flash fiction piece. I had to go on my own to do some research there. But when you look at the, the story, the shape of a story, it's, it's very economical. It's very efficient in comparison to a novel, which I've you know, described as a big saggy mess. And I do have to stick with that description because there's so much leeway in the novel for, um, for kind of a laziness, for madness, for dysfunction. And that might also look like humanity in a way. So <laughs> I was going to say. Big, you have to accept that. But the actual design of it, you know, it doesn't have to look like any formulaic structure that we've seen in other in other texts. If we really, really, you know, ex, you know, look at the different kinds of, you know, uh, works and books and things that have existed, we can just call them a novel if we feel like it. But is it really? And I think the, I think you know, the designer kind of saw that. You know, the, it's a little bit unusual. It doesn't quite fit the standard perception of what a novel is, or it's looking more like, you know, the human mind right now. And that's also something we, can, we need to sort of evaluate and put into and put into quotation marks as something to um, to consider a little bit more deeply. At least that's how I see it. And I think that's you know if I'm thinking about the mind mostly when I'm thinking about a reflection of you know humanity in, in literature, that was my goal more than anything else. And once I sort of released myself from sort of being you know stuck with this kind of form that's really slow and kind of and kind of it drags to me in my brain because I'm used to to language being a little bit more dense and a little bit you know you reach that moment of grace or or meaning quickly and then you're able to let it go and go on with your day but a novel has to it holds you it's got you by the back of the neck and you have to and also if it's going to be good it has to have you by the back of the neck it can't just sort of you know linger and and you know you get you know get tired with it and you have to sort of put it down but if it exhausts you in this kind of you know magical way that's when it's doing the right thing as well so i had to kind of tap into all of those things that i know a short story has to do in order to to kind of embrace this this other form for myself well, I, that resonates with me, this idea of like wanting to be efficient, even if you are writing a novel and to make sure that like every word counts and that there isn't any extra, there's no extraneous motion in a, in a novel. That's kind of the challenge of it to me. That's the work of the writer, just as like I conceive it. And as I was prepping, I read that I think you were in graduate school Maybe it was your MFA. Do you have your PhD or is it just MFA? Just MFA. That's the terminal degree for the creative writers. They've made a few programs that do go up to the PhD for, for fiction and things, but they're, and they're not that common. Okay. So you, as an MFA student, it was like your dissertation or not your dissertation, whatever it is, your final project. Yep. The thesis. Yeah. The thesis. That's right. <laughs> I got my MFA. I don't even remember what it was called, but <laughs> you had a 300 page thesis that you were working on and you whittled it down to four pages. That's right. Yep, so this is, this is, this is, this is, this is your, <laughs> this is your, this is your like theory in action right there. It really is. No one told me to do this though, which is a great thing. So I had to sort of, you know, figure out how to, to teach myself what I liked about my own work that I could do again and again. So, the having written that that big you know 
book, it was over 300 pages. It was this sort of not, like I said, no, novel in quotes. I thought it was a mess. So it was all over the place in my brain, you know, I had tons of characters and lots of, you know, just wild things going on. And, and, but it didn't all add up to anything that was really, really interesting to me. So I decided to just go through each page, each sentence, and just highlight the lines that I liked, just the, the moments themselves that worked for me. So I had tons of stuff that was just not not kept at all. Pages and pages just scratched out, scratched out. But every once in a while, I get one sentence. Ooh, oh, nice little <laughs> bright line. And then sometimes a whole paragraph. Every once in a while, a page would stick out. And then I would just, I took all of those lines all by themselves and just put them into you know a file and then arranged it collapsed characters, re, you know, different voices became the same voice. And all of this worked out in order to sort of get one little story, get the, the thing that was the most interesting out of all of the other things. And I liked it, sent it out, published it. And that was sort of a, a, a learning moment for me, just about pub the publishing industry too, because flash fiction is more um, acceptable just because of the size of it. You can feel it's like poetry, you know, po poets can, you know, put two or three stories and um, two or three poems in any, any journal. That's pretty easy because they can fit 40 of them in there. Short story writers, only two or three can usually make it into a journal. Flash fiction, you got more room. You're kind of squeezing in on the poet territory there because, you know, they, they can make room for it. And also it's that weird kind of form where there's not a lot of competition at the time. You know, there's this sort of like, what is this thing? It's got, it's a story. It's also poetic in a way because the lines are so dense, you know, so it's got this kind of cross genre appeal where different editors have a, have a stake in the, in the, in the existence of this thing. So I started recognizing all of that and this was, you know, 15 years ago. And um, so then I, I began to cycle through those kinds of things to start sort of in, emphasizing uh, the flash form on my own time. Um, and it worked out, I think in those, in that, in those training years. <laughs> so, in terms of the ratio, like 300 pages written to four pages in the final product, is that something that you've continued to do as a writer? Like, do you have a really high ratio of unused pages to used pages when you're working on a piece of flash or on, on your novel? I haven't counted. That was the only one I know because we had to know, know the word count and the page count so, so closely because it was a thesis. We had to you know, mark those numbers all over the place. So I was really aware of that. But... For my other work, I do overwrite. I don't know about how much in terms of the ratio, even the book, you know, Dead in Long Beach, California, there's a ton that I did not keep. I cut a lot of stuff out because it didn't work for me. It wasn't interesting. It was actually, I was writing it more to distract myself from the harder scenes that I knew I had to write and I didn't think I was ready for them. And then, um, and then once, you know, I had to sort of schedule, <laughs> schedule the time and say, yes, you're going to have to get this scene done. And then I would, I would do that. So, but during the revision stages, when I started to see that those hard scenes that I thought might not even work, that was the real story. And then I would start, I would start to trimming, you know, I trimmed out a lot of the, the distraction moments, the, the more pleasant kind of fantasy moments and was able to sort of distill them into the, the things that were, that were kept. So I would say yes, if I, you know, from far away, I wouldn't have, I wouldn't have said it, but up close, yes, I do overwrite in order to, to get to the, the essence of what I'm really trying to say. I don't think I do it so much when I'm writing specifically flash fiction stories, because I know what I'm looking at. I know how to see it a little bit better than I used to. Um, I can, I can hear the sentences clearly before I commit them to paper. And sort of, I'm able to sort of, dis, you know, dismiss and keep a little bit more efficiently, I think, with my flash fiction. When I'm writing, you know, and I know that this is going to be a small story. But with my bigger stories, yes, I do overwrite in order to, in order to refine. And am I hearing you correctly that at least with Dead in Long Beach, California, some of the overwriting was in essence a kind of avoidance? Mm -hmm, absolutely. Because this and is a And I didn't know it at the time. Well, but this is a book that deals with very delicate and heartfelt, difficult human experience. It's about grief and to write into deep grief that has some level of personal connection. I mean, and any writer who's writing about grief is probably working from some sort of personal place and to go into those spaces it's not necessarily pleasant. I can see how you might luxuriate in writing the more 
uh, pleasant, less emotionally taxing fantasy sequences. <laughs> mm -hmm. That's exactly how it was going. When it's about grief, grief, the hard part of grief you know, that I've experienced, and you know, a lot of people, especially if you're at a certain age, you have experienced this, these things where you lose people. And grief manifests in not just the loss of the the body of the person. Sometimes you lose people because you're you know just on different journeys. You hit your these certain relationships do crack and they spread and they they separate. But when it is that absolute final kind of grief, when the you know a person is gone forever, that hurts in a very specific way that I haven't been able to forget. So you just sort of you learn how to compartmentalize. You learn how to live with um, with a wound. People talk about healing and they talk about all these things. The book specifically is not about healing because I don't have those answers. I don't have that 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 route in my own experience and my own kind of imagination right now about what a specific kind of grief is like. I just I know I know what it's like in that initial stage very, very well. And I cannot forget it, but I can, of course, live and be happy and do joyful things around it. Of course, because that's, that's part of, you know, maturing and part of growing up and part of being an old person too. I've, I've started to recognize that in a lot of people <laughs> as I've also become an, an adult, that a lot of these adults are carrying around a lot of things that we don't talk about. We don't see it, but it's in the, it's in the body. And I was obsessed with that when I was writing a lot of scenes, I do the, I've been reading some of the earlier scenes out of the book where the character Coral has to interact with people. She's in her, her ma major kind of, you know, mental crisis and breakdown and denial. She's in this hot, this, this stage in the early stages of, a, of it where she hasn't told anybody that she's lost her brother to, in this, you know, very horrific way. And she's sort of doing normal things. And only the reader knows what's going on. Only the voice going on that, that, that's telling the story knows. And I remember what it was like to be that, to be in that state where everyone else seems normal and happy and they're just buying pineapples and, and shopping for with their children, <laughs> you know, and, and picking out a cheese in the store. And you're, and my entire world is destroyed. And I'm kind of walking among them, trying to pretend to be normal in a way. Almost, you know, you create this mask. You're kind of masking it. And you're doing it because it's, it's socially required of you because nobody wants you to answer that question where you say, where they say, how are you? You're not really supposed to answer that question to strangers, um, and let alone sometimes people that are closest to you. You have to, you have to give them just, you know, whatever else you have to sort of become this show. And that became a lot of the, the interesting part of sort of examining humanity and also doing so in a way that's far away from the grief that became kind of a comforting, a comforting state as well. Let alone just, you know, the the <laughs> the debt collecting, you know, lesbians, assassins, you know, all that kind of stuff. That was just fun and and kind of nuts and coral sort of really dissociating, the main character dissociating from the the circumstances at hand, which is necessary, I think, in order to manage grief, not to heal from it, not to to even understand it, but to hold it, in order to sort of put it in your backpack and carrying it along with you, you've got to be able to make it small, make it distant. At least that's sort of how my brain was working. So I think it's worth having us talk about the conceit for this novel, which I think is really brilliant. And this is the way I would characterize it anyway, is that it is about a woman, the aforementioned Coral Brown, who discovers her brother dead. He has committed suicide. And he didn't lock his phone. So she has access to his phone in the aftermath of this horrific shock. And she spends a week essentially pretending to be him digitally, answering texts, communicating with friends and family members as though she were him. And in this way, she is protecting others from the terrible news in a, in a way, and also protecting herself from having to fully confront it. How does that hit you? Does that square with what you were intending? I think so. It's, it's really close. You know, there might be some other thing that, that um, only, only uh, the book itself could kind of explain because it's not just protection. There's also this layer of of cruelty that kind of starts to manifest the longer she's invested in this. 
um, activity. And that that's kind of closer to a lot of feelings that people have. We don't want to talk about them. We always want to sort of be, you know, be able to empathize and sympathize with people that are going through a lot of grief. But sometimes folks get mad and they get bitter and they get, they go into dark places. And anger um, is usually the first mass that people that have when they're, when they're feeling very hurt. Even if the hurt is um, not directly towards them, but Coral does that. She gets mad, essentially. She has that rant early on, which I really did connect connect to and um, had to sort of channel a lot of old <laughs> old grievances in order to, to, to manifest that on the page. And I think the anger always is, you know, it's in the state of, you know, being kind of amorphous. It changes. And the things people do when they're angry can can change as well. It's not just you know, physical violence, a different kind of violence. But that on top of the need to to protect, the need, the state that you're still, you know, still loving these people. You still love the ones that you've lost. You still love the people that are going to feel that hurt um, that you feel later. So there's this combination of this weird state of um, somewhat accidental cruelty and the way that rage kind of, you know, um, acts out our or how we act out our rage in certain ways that's part of it as well as that kind of you know trying to manage it trying to soften trying to delay uh, horror from people that you really care about and also and, yourself <laughs> right this book if nothing else really does a wonderful job of portraying the complexities of grief and some of the unexpected ways that it can manifest, uh, as you were just saying, like people sometimes get really angry and irrational mm -hmm. when they're yes. in a state of deep grief. And with that grief comes confusion. There can often be resentment, unsettled scores between the person who is grieving and the person who has been lost. There's all sorts of different ways that it can manifest. and. There's also this idea that you brought up a moment ago about walking through the world as an adult in particular in a state of deep grief where you're just kind of carrying it around mm -hmm. and putting on this mask and moving through the world in a quote unquote normal manner. <laughs> That's a very odd part of the human experience, the way that we are sort of expected to do this. You know, every culture has its own, you know, ways of, um, of, of managing their dead, but let alone managing their, their mourning process. And I did it for, I don't know if I put this in a story a long, long time ago, but I did a lot of research about it. And, you know, some cultures, you know, they have the, the sky burial where, you know, the, the bodies are, are prepared for um, carry on birds to consume. So there is no there is no burial. There are no remains. You know, that's a different way of returning the body to nature. Um, there's another culture where they exhume the dead every few years and party with them. I think that one is really fun and I, I wouldn't do it myself, <laughs> but I think it's really cool. They prop them up, you know, at a, like, a, like a table, like they're just, you know, and they dance, they dance with the, the bodies. And it's just, you know, amazing how people, how grief, you know, and mourning, you know, develops and what feels right to people at certain times. And there are no wrong answers here. There's no right or wrong answer, as long as we're absolutely not, you know, doing harm um, to to families and to, it's, it's that perception of harm that really matters as well too. Um, and it varies from culture to culture. So, but yes, but like I said, it's, it's, we're all human. There is nothing that is sort of, you know, the way to do it. It's just all of these other kinds of ways. And I was, I was, you know, I always think about this, just the, the weirdness of, of humanity. And I feel like our civilization is a little weird. <laughs> like, you know, I, mean, I think about all these other kinds of cultures and like how my mind is not that normal. It's not, you know, in any kind of way. We, we do all of these, you know, ceremonies um, in different buildings and transport the bodies to different places. And all that might seem really strange to other people as well. But just the, the idea that we don't really allow folks space and time to grieve before they have to go back to, to the things they have to do. You know, we have 
we have a certain amount of period time. We have this, these designated periods of time where we say, okay, now you can need to go back to work. You need to make money. You need to go to, you got to buy your groceries. You got to take care of your families, you know, whatever else it is. And then, um, and, and don't over, oh, don't go beyond that time limit. Don't need more than that because now you're being strange. Now you're being offensive to the, to the rest of the world. And I feel like that is just, it's, it's a hard thing to manage, but we don't really make space for that at all. It's just, we, we accept it. We have to say, okay, that's, this is how it's going to be. And so for Coral, for this character, she allows herself more time, I think, than she would have been given had she not gone through, <laughs> had she not made this really um, odd uh, choice in the moment. And I think that is such a gift that we don't, we don't, no one has. That is the fantasy. You know, the, the story, I always say it's a nightmare and a fantasy altogether. So it's that I, I sort of wanted to, to engage in that, in that well, space. Well, and this is a story that is inspired by some real life experience. I was reading in the profile of you in New York Magazine that when your mother died in 2008, the news was so difficult to bear for your brother that he refused to tell his daughter because his daughter had had such a special relationship with your mom, her grandmother. And so it was difficult for him to break the news to her. And that was really the seedling for your novel. Like that was the, the core experience that informed it. There were a lot of them. We talked to about um, the phone as an object too. I don't remember if this made it into the, the journal, but um, when when she passed, I didn't have the phone numbers for all of my my relatives and even my other brother that lived not too far from me at the time in Arizona. They weren't in my phone. She was the my mother was the person that contacted everybody else and then relayed messages back. <laughs> so it was you know if you want to tell somebody something, you just tell her, and then she told everybody else. But that wasn't an option now. So all I had to do to, in order to make those conversations happen, I had her phone and it was unlocked. This was old time. So it was one of those flip phones from the kind of basic things. So I had to call everybody through her phone. So they were all receiving, um, they all thought that she would be there, you know, when they were, you know, answering the phone. And I think that too was part of the kind of this, this, this other layer of um, kind of memory that turned into the fictional story of all these different parts of that particular kind of um, loss and that, that grief that was going on there, how it, how it worked that, out. Well, it's oh, a, I've... it's a, it's a really good point that you bring up about the importance of the phone to contemporary grieving <laughs> The phone, the cell phone in particular, as a, an artifact of a human life is powerfully important and contains so much. I just went through this recently with the loss of a friend who's, uh, after his, you know, after the passing of this person, there were discoveries made on the phone that mm. shifted perception and you know, I won't get into details, but you can no, imagine. Fine. Yeah. I mean, it's just like, it's just really resonant with me. And I think it's the same for everybody. Somebody passes away who's close to us and we have access to their phone. There's probably going to be a reason to need to go into it, even if only to like close out like phone bills or something, you know, or to access yeah. numbers. And yet we spend so much of our lives on these machines and are invested in them to such a great degree in terms of communication that it is natural for survivors to excavate and to try to maybe even it could be, you know, really uh, positive in some ways and natural to the grieving process to want to access communication so that you can read their words or hear their voice and that sort of thing. But it definitely plays a central role, right? In, in the way we mm -hmm. kind of leave a trail of ourselves behind for others to discover it's true and it's such a vulnerable state you know i mean if the dead don't, they don't feel vulnerable but it's it does it does sort of have that that kind of you know sudden exposure all of a sudden and like you said these you discover things that you didn't know what you would and that's definitely you know very very real 
when it comes to it. Not so much for older people, you know, I didn't have that kind of memory with, with my mom specifically because, you know, it's, you know, it's just her phone. There's nothing but contacts. It wasn't a smartphone at the time. There's no, all the, all of the, the digital identity and the, the recrafting of oneself that you can do in digital spaces did not happen yet. So, so that was different, but for another age group, you know, it, I had to open it up and start thinking about, okay, what, what else could happen? And there's all the gender <laughs> differences and, and all of these things that come to, um, that come to, to, to be very significant when you're, when you're in there. I like that I didn't go down sort of the, I'll say it here, I don't know if this is appropriate, but the dick pic um, route, because, you know, there's a, they're, they're, diff, they're very different kind of um, people. And that seemed to be a little bit too expected to sort of find that kind of thing in, um, in the phone. I like that there was, there was, there are more sort of gentle relationships happening uh, that she, that she suddenly imposed herself upon and kind of wanted to rewrite for, for uh, you know, in ways that, you know, she thought would be more appropriate, which also matches my personality of, you know, trying to, trying to think that everybody should do something one way, um, but they never do. So they never do. They never yeah. do. I have, I have some of that too. I think we all maybe have some of that where you're like, I know exactly how other people should be doing things. I'm not entirely sure how I should be doing things, but other people, I got it figured out. <laughs> Absolutely. Maybe it's a Leo thing, but, but also self-reflection is very, very hard. It's uh, the hardest thing I think maybe for people to do on their, on their journey, their spiritual journeys, whatever you want to call it through life. But it is, it is very difficult to judge oneself more so than judging someone else and do and do it in an honest way so where you, where you see your your violence you see your your beauty all together it's really challenging yeah i think that that there's a lot of dishonesty in human experience and it's not just dishonesty in an interpersonal way but also in an intrapersonal like an interior way we're dishonest with others we're dishonest with ourselves we're dishonest online we don't necessarily embrace or show the uglier parts of ourselves. We sort of, you know, so much of, I feel like the, even the dialogue around human experience these days tends to deny a lot of the complexities of what it actually is like to be alive because these complexities are considered quote unquote bad or mm -hmm. they'll get you ostracized or you know yeah. what i'm saying yeah all all of it it's like it doesn't really square with how i think life is actually lived you know i think that we need more honesty and compassion for one another because we're all a mess <laughs> or most of us anyway yes. that is the the most honest you know <laughs> reflect reflective kind of statement uh, but most people, yes, we're not designed to do that. And we also engage in all of these, um, you know, worlds and arenas that are specifically designed for us to create ourselves, to, to be, you know, this, this strange farcical entity that is not entirely, you know, true to any kind of human you know, filters and all this kind of jazz that we do online, the constant, you know, comparing oneself to another person uh, that you can't even really see, that you don't really know. No matter no matter how close you think you you've gotten to some sort of you know parasocial relationship or whatever's going on <laughs> online, that that it is not real, and yet it's trying to it's governing how we how we see the world and how we see ourselves, and it's just this kind of ma magnified version of what we can we tend to do anyway, but it's in such as you know this extraordinarily kind of bloated state right now that. We have to do some some serious um, corrections in, in the short term. I think we will too. I do think that we're going to figure out all of the the tools, the the um, the social media, the AI. I think we will figure it out, and it will become just one more thing that we use, and that doesn't quite destroy us. <laughs> well, that's optimistic. optimistic. I like to I like to hear that. I like to hear that. That's usually I'm, everyone everyone I'm seeing online is like apocalyptic know, about right? it. No, I don't really see it that way. But also, I think I, because I am a student of humanity, right? I'm an artist. I, I think about people all the time. And I have to sort of, I write, I listen to them deeply. I write, I write about them, folks that I've seen, and I, I think about it. And I don't see humanity. This is my, un, this, this is not hopeful, what you're going to hear. I don't see humanity changing in any great way 
And that can be really sad to some folks because we are a mess. I don't see the mess becoming worse. I don't see it becoming better either, though. And that means that we have to really, really look closely because the good and the bad is happening right now all the time. All we get is a choice. We get a choice to engage in one or the other. And and I, I call it good or bad, but it's really it's 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 just it's just who we are. And I really it bothers me, too, when people call, you know, we see a heinous crime or something in the news and they say, oh, the person was you know, acting monstrous or inhumanely, you know, that always bothers me, too, because that's another thing that's that's creating this separation and an, an inability to reflect because even the word inhumane doesn't make sense to me. Like the most creative and, and vile acts that I think happen on this planet are by humans. And it has happened over generations, but also the most kind and generous and sort of beautiful mir miracles of being alive happen in human beings, in our relationships. It's all there. But if we keep trying to you know, create the separation that we're not capable, that a normal human is not capable of these things, then we're not going to we're not going to make any kind of you know, growth. And I think we are capable of periods of um, enlightenment and these sort of cycles of, of, of rich thought and philosophy where we remember that the value of life is not in a dollar. <laughs> it's not in money. It's in everything else. And we don't think that the richest people in the world are the wisest. We remember that. Oh, that's right. <laughs> You can be brilliant and be very poor. You can, you know, you can, you can create all kinds of solutions and, and things that ease the suffering of mankind. And you don't have to have, you know, a billion dollars to do it. You just have to have the will to be compassionate and will, but you know, it happens, it happens in cycles. And then, you know, there's, there's the dark cycles that fall on top of them and everything else. So like I said, it was not going to be hopeful what I said, <laughs> the follow up to that. But I do think we will be fine. I do think we will be fine, ultimately, even though the book does not say so. Well, yeah, that mean, it begs the question, it sounds like you're in a good place spiritually, but I think you were raised Southern Baptist, growing up here in Southern California. And just because of the thematic concerns of the book, I'm wondering where you are spiritually at this stage of your life. My friend, my librarian friend asked me that. I said, I'm fine. <laughs> uh, yeah, she is a fan of the, the story and she knows a lot of the, all of the, the drama and things that happens in my family and all that kind of stuff. And, but no, I am, I do feel, um, you know, all, I'm, I feel sometimes overwhelmed. I also feel at peace. I feel like today is not that much different than you know a year ago but also it's extremely strange at the same time i think it's all just it's all happening uh for me so i feel fine i feel like i can manage the day <laughs> and the next day and the one after it well that's good and so yes so i do i do feel okay the subject matter is extremely heavy though and i and i get that because like i said those were those were hard hard scenes to write and i had to do a lot of out of thinking and journaling and, and all of that to, to make it, make it through some of those moments. And then, and then what was strange too, is that when I was writing a lot of the scenes, uh, they were sort of heavy places to be. I had to sort of, you know, decompress. And I, I thought, I, I thought it was terrible, you know, when I was kind of in the, in the weeds, I call it. And then later on during the revision, I would read some passages and they were just hilarious. And I would think, <laughs> And I think, it, you know, having having written it and not laughed at all and then reading it and then and cracking up, I was thinking, wow, how much can 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 happen just in the in time and being in temporal different temporal, you know, states of states of being. And also, is it still is it all still the same? Right. That it could still be tragic and funny simultaneously. That's I think right. that's, you know, I think that's the, the only kind of realistic, you know, part of life I think I could probably capture in there. So I want to talk to you about the structure of the book and the way it takes place over a week yes. and it deals with the seven stages of grief, right? I mean, is that the, stru that the structural idea underpinning no. the book? The, the, the timeline, no. <laughs> <Okay>. yes. <laughs> In a way. I mean, it, it is a week, but it's also the beginning and end of humanity as well. <laughs> So the, the voice allows itself to go far, far, far into the past and also far, far, far into the future, imagining uh, a, a 
an earth, I guess, where humanity is already gone. And then sort of, you know, being in this state of celebration. I call them um, librarian archivist kind of catalog, <laughs> cataloging sort of entities um, that that look at humanity in this in this way of kind of, you know, honoring them almost like foreign, you know, deities that are their creators, but and they sort of just emulate all the the many ways the 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 gorgeous and the grotesque, you know, of of us, and that's sort of the the end of of humanity is that where we're nothing more than our data and our in our in our archives, and it's kind of lovely to me, and I also feel like that too is a way of sort of living on, you know, because what is what is a child, what is the offspring except for just kind of organic data <laughs> carrying. <laughs> Carrying on, in a way. So, That's one way to look at it. Oh yeah, one way. You know, and sometimes, but you know, it's a little bit better because this this data actually likes you. So there's a kind of a guarantee. Right. <laughs> sometimes, sometimes likes me. Right? Sometimes it's hit and miss. Uh, but but mm, exactly. I want to I want to talk to you. I want to talk to you about the some of the things you're alluding to here in terms of the narrative structure of your novel. And there are three different narrative strands, I believe, that you are weaving over the course of the book. Okay. There is, uh, there is choral story that is more like written in a kind of like a, I guess you would call it like a, a realism sort of mode. And then there is the graphic novel that Coral wrote. Mm -hmm. So there's text from an actual work of fiction that she herself uh, was writing. And then there is a kind of Greek chorus uh, of these like librarians that you're referencing who are decoding the kind of remnants of human life and celebrating it a bit. And it's written in a kind of uh, mysterious first person plural POV. And with respect to this, this third strand with this mm -hmm. first person plural and these like you know, this Greek chorus of uh, AI librarians or whatever. Yeah. <laughs> it's interesting to me how when I'm reading reviews of the novel, the various people who were reviewing the book all seemed to have a different understanding of that strand, or they characterized it in pretty distinct ways. Did you notice that? <laughs> I've been saying some uh, a variety of things. The later reviews I've, I've been seeing are really sharp so i think they're they're reading more deeply maybe than some of the earlier ones um but the, even the early ones kind of got the essence of things but yet it is it is kind of a mix but, but i'm going to come back to that but i want to talk about the stages of grief a little bit brief uh, more because you mentioned that earlier as a thing and it's, it's this is definitely not trying to cover all of the stages of grief it is stuck in one <laughs> so it's it, it doesn't quite even get i guess you know at the point of acceptance maybe that's when the book ends. So it's not just not going to go into that. So it's sort of, it's right there and kind of the delirium of, of those initial, initial states of um, denial and rage, right? I don't know all of them in the, in the order or whatever it is, but it's kind of right in there. And then, and then once that passes, then it's over. So we're, we're not, like I said, it's not into the healing stages. It's not into, into the depth of, of acceptance. By the time she's ready to sort of face the, the music that's when the voice, you know, those final pages kind of leaps off into the into the cosmos and kind of goes away from from the characters and off into the into kind of this, you know, lovely oblivion, whatever you want to call it. So yeah, so that. But now coming back to the actual voice, I think you nailed it in terms of the three layers. So those are that, that is what's going on there. So we've got the frame story of of Coral, um, and she and she speaks very briefly, kind of lucidly through through the. Um, through the dialogue and so in some of in some of the voice very every one every once in a while and then there's the of course the inserted pieces the graphic novel but it's all choral and then there's the final voice which is the 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 voice that that narrates the graphic novel begins to narrate for choral in a way that views humanity as this kind of great span expanse of things but it's still just choral's life it's mostly just her memory, just her essence. So even when they're talking about all the different clinics where they practice these these aspects of humanity, those are just her memories that they're remembering. They don't have access to anything uh, human except through her as that kind of conduit 
for it. So, so yes. So I think you got you got the the layering in there pretty well. I I read a really good one from uh, KQED recently, and um, I think she really she really kind of really understood sort of that 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 last layer in there in terms of the the closeness to to the character, and yet it's need to be far far away in order to manage the the horror at hand. If that makes sense, does that make sense? <laughs> yeah, no, I mean, but what we're talking about here is a kind of blend of like fictional realism and then kind of science fiction, fantastical, cosmic, I mean, even spiritual, like this book contains a lot. And I'm curious to hear you talk about how you landed on this approach. It must have required some experimentation, right? Where you're testing things out and they aren't working or you got frustrated with just doing things in a realistic mode and you wanted to engage with other parts of your imagination. Can you just talk about that part of it? Like how you made these creative decisions and ended up with this particular blend? I didn't, I couldn't even begin the book until I had the voice. So I knew... You know, for when I'm writing, it usually just involves me lounging around. <laughs> People think I'm not working, and it's it is very insulting, and it's a source of resentment to for all parties involved when they observe me kind of just sitting in a chair, spinning around, or just you know lying on the couch. I'm working. I am thinking. I'm 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 plotting. I'm I'm reflecting, and that's the hard part. And and once I figured out that particular sound of the weed is kind of almost it's a little bit childlike but it's also very you know authoritative because it does have that first person plural anytime you have that that plural narrative it does carry this kind of credibility because it's you know it's not just oh i think this but it's sort of we think this and how big is the we is it you know is it a, is it a republic is it you know the entire you know um government how you know and it's and it sort of has that kind of you know uh, epic sort of feel. It's like I had that, and I knew it was gonna, it's gonna, you know, play itself around um, through these sort of listing of of things that that are um, kind of insignificant, right next to the to the grand and the the profound. So I had that. So once I got that kind of voice down, I was able to kind of write through the prologues and, and the the early sections, and then I could go and I, I could I could run with it. Now the the breaking up of the the wildfire sections um, into them. At first, it was going to be all. It was going to be more more I guess fluid in the way that it was presented. But I didn't like it once I was doing some sort of halfway into the into the writing of the the book, and I started to have to trim some things down. And I said, no, I'm going to have to make those sections much smaller because the the harder parts that I'm trying to avoid need the space. And I know it's going to make the book smaller, but I was fine with that. So, <laughs> so I was kind of going through through these these different um, uh, big big chunks of fantasy land writing, and kind of reducing that down, and then uh, and then focusing in on the the smaller frame story of the the trauma and the and the actual sort of ordinary days, and kind of writing that. And then I, I realized that the history the memory sections kind of needed their own format, something that could sort of signal it to the reader. And I have to, and I talk about this too, when I'm, when I'm teaching things, you have to just create signposts for your reader when you're dealing with time. So they know where they are and how they're moving through it. And I don't like the ordinary kinds of, um, you know, just put a, put a year or something there or, or um, little, little phrases at the beginning of a paragraph that says, you know, 12 years ago, this and this and this happened. That's not fun <laughs> for me. <laughs> it has to be more interesting just to hold my attention. So that's when I started to create the clinics. And then I had to, and then I got into the weeds with the clinics too, because there's so many of them and they, and they had to both summarize the, the memory as well as be relevant to the momentum of the story. So I got a little bit, I started going a little bit crazy as I was writing some of those but they were really still fun for me, especially the one that I I pulled out um, as a flash fiction piece for the um, in the clinic for telling lies to avoid pending death. That one, <laughs> so I did. I had I really had a lot of fun writing those those memory sections um, in in that particular voice. So those are yeah, that's most of the the things that created the kind of structure. I think the the journey I was on there. 
Um, well, and then, yeah, well like said, and creatively, well, and then creatively, yeah. I mean, when it comes to trimming and it comes to writing these, the clinic sections as an example, but really just writing the whole novel, you are coming at this as somebody who, as you mentioned earlier, considers herself primarily a writer in the short form. Mm -hmm. And something I noticed about this novel line by line is something that I will often notice when I read a novel by a poet in that there's, there seems to be a great music and a great attention to every line. Like each line feels like it's really sculpted. And I'm wondering how you conceive of the relationship between all the work that you've done in flash and how it translated to writing longer form fiction in terms of things like pacing. Uh, but also maybe some of the, where, where I think it could probably serve you pretty well, because this book definitely moves. And I think somebody who's versed in flash fiction is good at that, but were there challenges that the longer form presented to you because it kind of cut against what you are most naturally inclined to do on the page. So can you just talk a little bit more about the relationship between the two? Yes. And it was challenging. Even still today, I'm, I'm, I'm working on a novel in my, in my sort of research stages of, of lounging and thinking and, and doing some, <laughs> doing some actual, actual research too. I am reading because it's a historical um, kind of focus on it. So I need some grounding there, but I don't, like I said, I, the, the long form is really hard. I, maybe it's hard because I care about the line so much and less about the plot. And also, I love poetry. I love the poets. I don't consider myself one, even though my, my poet buddy, uh, Bren Saito, she says I am a poet, but I'm, that's just her being generous. But I do love the, the poets and I do read poetry. And I have, I have a, a, a great appreciation for what they do with language and meaning and sort of and feeling. And that matters to me, but I do also care about characters. I do care about structure and narrative structure. And I, I, I like a good story and I like to watch people. And I think um, the, the, short, the flash fiction form embraces those things that I love the most. Economy of language, meaning, insight into in small amounts of, of words while still thinking about a whole life, thinking about what it means to be you know, human in relationships and all those kinds of other things that only story really tries to to, to sort of do in, a, in an orderly way. So that definitely informed a lot of how I approached each line, of course, in the in the in the book. And I've had people tell me that you know a lot of times you know I I, I keep creating these sort of summaries and histories of of really big things in each single line, and that's exactly what flash fiction has to do. <laughs> Sometimes you can you can do it, and you know you can take a whole page or so, and then that final part, you know. And technically, for me, it has to be the penultimate part of the flash fiction story that really gets you to the meaning of it. And then the, the last part is just sort of the, the, the goodbye. But I, I, had to, I had to think about that a lot just to make myself comfortable with moving through this, this big, big book. You know, I don't, I haven't, hadn't written um, hundreds of pages for a single story in a long time since my thesis. I had not investigate, you know, invested any energy in the, in the novel since then. So it was, it was hard to do. It was just hard for me to to feel comfortable and at ease with with the 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 thing at hand because I could not see the beginning or the end of the whole book at any given moment the same way I can with flash fiction or even a short story because for those two I can I can do really small outlines and and a you know four bullet points that lets me know exactly what I have to do in terms of the structure of the story, the plot, the movement. And then I can just sort of have fun with the paragraphs, have fun with the sentences and kind of, like you said, be, you know, enjoy the rhythm of things, you know, it's like music, you know, just sort of enjoying it, listen to the song. And then, <laughs> then you kind of, <laughs> and even though it might be a sad song, it's fine. You're kind of moving through it. But for a whole novel, it's, you've got a lot going on there. And it was really, um, stressful <laughs> and, and to to re especially during sort of the middle part when I was kind of halfway through that was the most I had the most anxiety with approaching any kind of given day and I think that's when I really really had to zero in on my on my flash fiction 
brain in order to help me organize the the scenes at hand. And I did not write it in order. So so I did write a lot of things that happened in the early sections much later, but the very, very final pages I did write at the end because I had to do sort of an inventory of things to to figure out how to how to go how to say goodbye finally to all of the characters and everything. So so I did yes, I did have to really kind of tap into the poetry, tap into the music in order to make it through the form itself. And I still, like I said, I don't really love the novel. No offense to the novelist, but <laughs> but this is my interpretation of why. Well, a couple things that I'm hearing as, as I listen to you is that, first of all, like my experience of writing novels and trying to write novels and writing failed novels, all the things that we do over the course of time, if we're at this for a number of years, is yeah. that you have to get you have to get comfortable with living in uncertainty. That is the nature of writing a long form piece is that there are going to be extended periods where you don't know what's going on, <laughs> or you'll have times where you think you know what's going on, but then it later proves not to be the case. You learn that you actually had no idea and you were wrong and you have to start over yes. or head off in a new direction. And so you just have to get comfortable with that being how the sausage gets made. That is it. You're not doing it wrong if you are uncertain. Is that square with, with how you see it now? It still sounds so miserable. And I don't, <laughs> I don't want to have to keep doing this, but I probably will at least one more time it's, before I, I go back to make collections of, uh, of smaller work. But, but yes, but yeah, I think you're right. I think you're right about that uncertainty. But also even, you know, in the, in the smaller forms, you know, we are uncertain at times. We don't quite know. And like I said, I, I'm totally willing to cut. So that's never a problem. But it's it's just sort of, I guess, the, the, the wrangling in of all of the things that felt overwhelming and created a lot of anxiety, you know, at the, at the time. Well, but well, on the positive side of the ledger, I think that in a related way, while you have to live with all of this uncertainty when you're working on a novel, that's, you know, a, a work process that's usually unfolding over a number of years. One of the ways that you can make the process more tolerable is to give yourself small goals, like little small defined tasks so that rather than feeling overwhelmed with the weight of the entire project, you just say, well, today I'm going to write a page or I'm going to find my way to the end of this particular discrete scene. And I think this is how most of us, whether we realize it or not, get through a novel project. And in this way, I can imagine that uh, having a background in flash fiction or even like free verse poetry can serve you well because that project is something that you are very familiar with working in these discrete short bursts and kind of getting in and out uh, as efficiently as possible. I think you're right. I think if everybody's writing it like that, then that, that, you know, that is the way to go. Because like I said, when I got sort of halfway, that's when I embraced it. And I would sort of just do, you know, a section and it wasn't about sort of the page length of the section so much as it was the uh, concept or idea or whatever it is I'm dealing with. So it might just be kind of depression and then like, you know, pancakes or whatever it is. And that was the, <laughs> that was the goal for the, for the moment, for the, for the day or the, the section I was writing. And sometimes it could be really fun where I'm just sort of, you know, I have to write just three sentences that, that contain a certain object. Because I'm carrying this object around and I'm trying to make it evolve and have different kinds of, you know, layers to it, whatever it is in the story. And those were those were the fun parts. Those were the fun days of writing. It was still hard, though, you know, because, like I said, I would write that section and then, and then how, I would not know how it's going to really tie in to the rest. I just had to trust it. And that was maybe my control freak nature or something was, <laughs> was you know, struggling but uh, but yeah, that what that did become the process. So if everyone's doing it that way, that is how that is how you can get it done. I wish there was an easier way. Yeah, right. I mean, how long did it take you to write this novel? 
it's pretty fast actually because I do write kind of quickly but I started it in 2020 and I sent in my final draft in the fall of 2022 okay that's I mean that's good that's good that's a good clip but it's not like crazy I was expecting you to say you wrote it in like three months which would have made me oh, no, no, angry no. <laughs> no 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 it's not that kind of thing <laughs> okay good I'm relieved I'm relieved but I, I want to talk before uh, we part company. I want to talk with you a little bit about your personal history. I'm always curious to know a bit about how writers form. And I know from researching a bit that you grew up in Compton here in Los Angeles, that you are the youngest of three and that you graduated high school at age 16. Is this correct? Oh, that's right. That's all right. Okay, so what kind of kid, what kind of kid were you? If you know, you seem like you must have been pretty sharp if you're graduating high school at 16. Uh, I was sharp with language. I was I was always kind of good with words, and and that served me very well. My mom was, you know, she had me reading really early, so that helped, of course. And numbers, not so much. Number, I care more about numbers now because I'm, you know, I'm watching all my retirement funds and stuff <laughs> in the early <laughs> right? days. Looking at yeah, those royalty no, statements. <laughs> no, none of that yet. I mean, this, we'll see what happens. But, but the right. but the early days, I didn't I didn't you know have much much care or or any sort of you know affinity for for numbers at all. I just kind of did it because I had to, and get and to get to get through things. My only A, I think, in a math class was for uh, pre calculus, and that was like a miracle. I was like, how in the world? I almost wanted to ask the teacher. Uh, his name actually was Math the Sin, which was funny. <laughs> I always want to ask him, like, did you make a mistake? I'm just going to take it and run. Just, just go with it. But yeah, so right. I, it was just, right. there were no, there are no stories. There's no people. There's nothing in numbers that had kind of, you know, an emotional connection for me. So I wasn't there, but everything else, you know, I, I did love to read. So I was always, I was always invested in that. And that worked out. And I almost skipped another grade, but my mom didn't want me to, because she wanted to sort of have me be a little bit normal and kind of, you know, stick around with, with um, my peer group and everything. And I also didn't want to leave all my friends and stuff too. So, so I stuck, I, I stayed with, um, with that, with that group and it, um, it was so, it was great. So I still have my friends that I had in middle school, Pam and Anita, <laughs> they're, they're my buddies. We've been friends for over almost 20, over 25 years, 27 years, something like that. But yeah, so those, that was me as okay. a kid, still very loyal, kind of bookish. Oh, I also did karate. Not a lot of people know that about me. I was a I was a, a martial artist in my earlier years, and we can blame the Power Rangers for that. So when that uh, episode aired, I was committed. I'm gonna learn. I'm gonna learn all these different things, and that kind of stepped with me. I did a lot of different <laughs> self defense classes and things as a as a teen, as an adult as well. Okay, so wait, I got to ask you then. Like, could you kick my ass? Um, I could probably keep you from kicking my ass long enough, <laughs> <laughs> long enough to to um, to move on with my day. I think. And I, I gotta say, kicking my ass is no wouldn't take much. I, you know, it's not like I'm a, a good <laughs> fighter. But I, I think the question that always arises for me when I think about karate and martial arts and self defense stuff is that it's one thing to like know the moves and to be able to like practice them in a controlled setting, but like if you're actually being assaulted or something like, you know, would it act, would it actually come back to you? Would it work in the heat of the moment? I guess you never know, right? The only real thing that does work is muscle memory. That's why practice matters. If you do something over and over again, over and over and over and over again, so if somebody grabs you on the, by the shoulder, you're going to just do that, uh, that motion, no matter what it is. And so it can work. It can work in practical senses. But if you just go take one class and think you're ready for the world, <laughs> Just like join the UFC all of a sudden, you might have a problem on your hands. You might have yeah. a large medical bill on your hands so or a lawsuit. So just have to, you know, know your know your strengths for sure and know your limits. And what I tell everybody, he's what telling a, this all the time, go for the a, eyes. <laughs> just... Oh, good to know. Mm -hmm. Don't play around. Don't play around. So wait, and when you say go for the eyes, you mean like claw the eyes, poke the eyes, just make them, it's, yeah. I guess they can't, they can't get you if they can't see you. <laughs> That's exactly right. You only have a few seconds, especially if you're a small person and you don't have a ton of skill, you got to go for the most vulnerable areas immediately and then get away. 
that's your that's your thing. You're not there to have a, a, a whole show. You're not you know, you're not getting paid for this this encounter. Right. It's not yeah. <laughs> you're not being filmed. This is not for no. television, you know. But no. The uh the thing I always was told or I, I seem to remember is that you're supposed to hit somebody in the nose because that sort of takes out their eyes. You hit them in the nose and then they, mm -hmm. their eyes water. So that's I guess right. that's shake them up. Real, and that's if they're being kind, up. you know, that's a very kind way to do it because they won't come out <laughs> mangled and damaged for the rest of their lives. If you go that route, that's nice. But if it's, you know, it's urgent and essential, you know, you might have to do more damage than that. And that's, we, we have really gotten far away <laughs> from that. Oh, this is what my show is all about. Okay. I love this. <laughs> that's fair. All right. But yes, that is that Okay, is absolutely so essential. last question. Last question then about the self-defense stuff is if you took martial arts classes, like, did you have like a belt designation? Did you become a black belt? I was never a black belt. So the highest I got when I was doing it as a kid was purple. So that was like third level or something there for that one. And I was pretty good. I won two tournaments, first place sparring. I was terrible at the, they call them the katas. And that's sort of like the kind of the dance, the performance of the the different moves. I was too stiff. I didn't. I didn't have the <laughs> the good timing. And yeah, quick, I don't think. Crispness. No, I don't think. <laughs> so, and was this taekwondo? This was actually kempo karate. I think they called it kempo. Okay. All right. So I have, you I have taken gra two taekwondo classes though. Oh, you have okay, but you you graduate high school at 16 you are a purple belt in kimbo <laughs> you're you're you uh you then go on to usc the university of southern california for undergrad that's right and what did you major in there i was a business major for the first couple of years so i was gonna go you know all corporate and just kind of do the do the thing make money that was my whole kind of vision i'm gonna i'm not gonna be a broke artist you know, wandering around trying to, you know, be a visionary or whatever it is. I just wanted to, you know, get rich, move on, do the American thing. And it did not fit my personality at all. The classes were boring, although I really liked my business law class. I don't remember the professor's name, but he was he was interesting because he made metaphors. He spoke in metaphors about the different things. And I remember he, he, he was comparing he was trying to make people think that assault and battery don't just automatically go together. He said, it's not like salt and pepper. These are, and that, that stuck with me. I was like, okay. And he would speak in those kind of <laughs> terms. So, so I, I did enjoy that class, but I, it's still the, the rest of them were not, were not giving me much, you know, um, spiritually or emotionally or anything, except for my creative writing class. I just kept taking all of those and doing really well in them. And eventually I had enough credits to graduate with an English degree, um, uh, but a business minor. And I said, let's switch that up. Get me out of here. This school is expensive. So. Right. Right. So that was, so rap. then yeah. you left USC and went to Arizona state for your MFA. I did. So I took a year off because I wasn't even sure. I applied to, to ASU and got in because my, my brother lived there. So I had family in the area. It didn't feel so foreign. I'd been to Arizona a bunch of times too. So I said, okay, I'll apply there. And I got in, but I didn't quite want to go. So I deferred attendance for a year, which I didn't know was really weird. So I, I got, got away with that. And then did um, I worked as a manager at Target for seven months or something a little more than that and it was a nightmare because i didn't i barely survived the holiday season that was out we're talking about stressful and overwhelming uh -huh. so i was <laughs> i was done with retail i said give me back in school where i know where i'm doing <laughs> I, I understand academia so right and that's where essentially i stayed so once i did grad school i kept you know i started teaching adjuncting and kind of you know all the way up until the the tenured professor position so I, I get, I get that world very well. So yeah, you're an, you're an academic and an author. And in terms of your creative life, I read that there was a moment in 2016 that was sort of pivotal for you creatively when you won the Prairie Schooner book prize and published black Jesus and other superheroes. Was that the moment? Like, do you feel like that was a breakthrough moment for you? 
that was a total breakthrough moment. I mean, nothing matters more for the kinds of you know teaching positions that I have now than the book. You just have to have a whole book in order to get a tenure track position. And that's the cushy gig, right? That's the one where you have time to write and publish and you can do grants and all kind of all that jazz. But before that, I was an adjunct. I was teaching four or five classes a semester. One time, a couple times I had six and seven classes a semester, which is a lot. And you're not making much money. You're just sort of, you know, going, going through the, through the, through the motions. I was fortunate enough or unfortunate enough to be able to buy a house because of the recession. Everything collapsed. So my tiny little salary was enough to buy a $75,000 house, which is, you know, now I, I don't, I sold it, but uh, now it's worth, I think probably close to 400,000 in that area. Wow. So yeah, it's just, you know, weird timing. Things kind of worked out and did not work out. So you're kind of struggling <laughs> while, while still kind of, you know, taking advantage of things that, that, you know, pop in. But the turning point for sure was definitely being able to get my first collection published. And also winning an award is not a small thing either which I never really thought was um, on the table. I knew I would get a book some kind of way. I didn't know how. I was pretty confident in that. Even when I mailed it off, I kind of said, you know, I like this collection. I might get like a second place thing and they can maybe, you know, <laughs> maybe that'll help with the, getting a publication. But to win it outright was really special. So, and, and they did a beautiful cover. And um, so that that worked out really well. And also the book kept kind of getting more attention here and there from other kinds of, you know, writing um, outlets and things. So that was nice. And then, yes, that was the thing that got me the job at Fresno State. So so it was very much a life changing moment. Wow. And so now you are teaching, you're writing, you're publishing novels, even though you prefer flash fiction. <laughs> you're working on, as you said earlier, another novel. And yep. I don't think we talked, we don't, we didn't, I don't think you said much about what it entails. Are there any hints as to what it's about? Yeah. So it's actually an expansion of a story, a long story that I did in a, a serialized way for the Gagosian journal quarterly. It's um, kind of a really fancy big one. I didn't know much about it until they asked if I wanted to submit to it. And I never would have thought anybody could just, um, or if, if I want to contribute to it. So they said, you can write anything that you want to write. So I ended up writing this story. I really considered doing some some creative nonfiction because every once in a while I write about politics and stuff and then I get in trouble and people get mad at me. But I said, let me just do something more, f <laughs> more fun. <laughs> and I wrote about, and I had a voice in my, you know, in, in my, in mind for it. And it was a, it was called Memoir of a Poltergeist. So it's about a, an entity and a, a poltergeist is a really old ghost. As far as I know, it's one of those ghosts that are so, so old, they've forgotten that they were human once upon a time, but they're very, very much intimately connected to humanity. They like to mess with people. So it's one of those kind of, you know, you know, you know, mischievous sort of, you know, kinds of, kinds of, you know, supernatural uh, uh, creatures. So I had the voice of this one, kind of this kind of, you know, wacky uh, poltergeist, this wacky spirit kind of, you know, moving around the reconstruction period of American, <laughs> the American South. And it essentially ends up uh, possessing the body of a, of a black lesbian in this small town and, and ends up in this kind of relationship that kind of goes, goes very weird. And there's also um, a kidnapping and a murder. It's, it gets nuts, but the voice has a lot of fun um, in this environment of watching people being and being able to sort of manipulate people. And, um, and yes, so I'm, I'm going to keep that voice. I'm going to have some more fun with that voice, but also do a little bit more research about the the um, race massacres that happened during the Reconstruction period of America. So everybody knows about the Tulsa uh, situation, but there were others kind of scattered around. And I found some really good databases that have newspapers from uh, Black towns and things that were documenting a lot of that. So I want to use that to kind of get, get a feel for things because uh, this one, I can't quite BS my way through just yet <laughs> because it is based in a real time. So I'm going to, I'm going to stretch my, my, my brain a little bit and also be, be um, very um, responsible with this because it is a very specific and important period that doesn't get talked about very often. 
And I'm going to do so in a way that has a little bit more irreverence than I think it probably deserves. So I have to go, <laughs> have to be careful. I'm treading lightly, but the story was fine. If you ever want to look at it. Wow. Okay. Well, that sounds like, like I, there's something about your work that I would classify as like wildly imaginative. The, the, the dead in Long Beach, California reviews that I've been reading have all noted how inventive it is and how it sort of breaks the form a little bit and does things that most novels don't tend to do, especially in the literary fiction realm. And this next one sounds like it's of a similar ilk. Like you like <laughs> to, you, but I think that's great. I think it's instructive to me as a writer and, and probably to people listening to remember that it it's okay to play. And yes. I had read that you, like, as you were coming up as a writer, you know, we're sort of modeling Toni Morrison as so many young writers do and thinking to yourself, you sort of internalized that you had to be a certain way on the page and that to be silly or to do things that might not be considered serious or something, you know, you it's kind true. of, were, you were trying to resist that. But once you stopped resisting that, then the writing came alive. That's just who you are. I think you're right, you know, and also people don't have to emulate the kind of playfulness that I have. That would be that would be nuts. But <laughs> but you have to figure out what is fun for you and being fun, and fun for you or anybody else might just be that kind of writing, that very Toni Morrison, serious kind of, you know, um, kind of this ancient, beautiful sort of language, you know, tapping into that and also wise, that kind of super, super wise, you know, insight into the nature of people and very dense, that might be the voice that is so, that is exciting for you and natural and fun. I am I'm much more goofy than Toni Morrison uh, ever was in her lifetime. I'm, I'm pretty sure. Although she didn't know how to have a party as well, just for the record. She, <laughs> she knew, she knew how to have a good time. But the, the, the point is to actually just figure out what works for you, what could be sustainable. And I think that, you know, doing that, that training exercise with my uh, graduate thesis was really important, was really instructive to figuring out the thing that I liked about my own work that I wanted to see over and over again in some capacity. And I think, you know, the experimentation, what people call experimentation, but to me just sounds, it's, it's just, you know, just, just writing, just having fun, is making it interesting to me is what's important. You know, you have to really figure out that, figure out what you like. Some people want to be writers, but they haven't even found their favorite book yet. You know, right. you got to read more. You got to read weird things more. I read a lot of nonfiction and I read, um, I read comics, <laughs> I read graphic, graphic stuff. I, I, you know, you have to really broaden your, ex your exposure to things and not be afraid to, in to, to integrate the different layers of yourself on the page. And yeah. Those are, all, those are all great lessons. Like stay open, read a lot, read widely, pay attention to what you like about your own work. Mm -hmm. I mean, that seems like something that should be obvious, but it's not something that a lot of us probably do when we self-evaluate. Usually we're so fixated on the things we don't like or the things we wish were better. Exactly. We don't, we don't really zero in on the things about our own creative work that we think is pretty great. So that's or a great reminder. About how the world is going to see things. Like, is this good? You know, if we're, if we're always asking that that question about our own work, you're not we're not ready to share it yet. Is it good? You have to sort of be at that point where I like it at least. <laughs> like right. I like this. <laughs> yeah, nobody else might like it, but I like it. You know. Mm -hmm. So, well, the last thing I want to ask you about is Live Right, which is a nonprofit okay. that you founded. I, I just think it's worth talking about so that listeners are aware. But you just explain what it is and how you decided to create it. Yeah, it started a few years ago. Well, actually, more years ago, probably seven years ago in Arizona when I was teaching there um, at the the downtown campus. And it was because a, a student came to me, one of my a, a former student came to me and was sort of you know a little bit distressed about the classes that she was taking. She didn't feel like people were sort of um, you know hearing her voice and sort of acknowledging her work in a way that was you know useful to her. And it's a it's a black woman. 
And she she said, can we do something else? Can you want to do a kind of a group or something? And I said, sure, we can do it. I didn't I didn't plan to do like a book club or anything, but something that was going to be you know respectful and useful where we're not sort of getting bogged down by the 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 kind of traditional way of doing workshops and where sometimes, you know, when you are the only person of color in a class, people can get kind of distracted by, you know, voices that they think are unusual or situations that they think are, are not plausible. And that can happen with, you know, queer characters too. I remember one time I, I had um, a story and someone said, there are a lot of gay people in here, you know, <laughs> as if, you know, more, as if more than one was just kind of outrageous. Like how in the world <laughs> can they all fit in the room or, you know, <laughs> So it's that kind of thing that can, can happen sometimes in workshops. Um, so she wanted to do something different. I said, yeah, we can go get together. And, and it started off with kind of just, you know, writers of color. And then I started expanding it to uh, youth programs. As I, so last year we did a, I did a grant for youth workshops in uh, Fresno County. So we were just sort of, it sort of became this kind of place where people that don't have access to professional writers, you know, that have a lot of uh, different experiences and different backgrounds, um, they can come and, and sort of see and kind of get some real instruction. So all of my professor friends, like I recruit them to do workshops for, for people in the community. And it's been going pretty well. So I, I like what's I like what's happening. I don't have a lot of energy to keep it going regularly. So we go on hiatus every every other year or so. <laughs> and then, I'm, then, I'm, then I say, okay, yes, yes, we can come back and we'll do some more. But um, yeah, that was the genesis. And now it's sort of, yeah, it's kind of open to making sure that people that don't have access to art and literature kind of, you know, instruction, they can, they can have it. Well, I have enjoyed meeting you. Congratulations on Dead in Long Beach, California. I wish you well with it. And I wish you well with the next novel. Thank you, Brad. We shall see what happens in the future. <laughs> <laughs> Good luck.